Welcome to Launchpad, the unique radio show and podcast that celebrates new book releases and the authors that created them. Now, let's take off with your host, Grace Salmon. Welcome to Launchpad. This is episode 36 with Anoop Judge, Edward J. Leahy, Kim McCollum, and Susan Sage, who will be joining us in just a moment. We are so excited today to have an amazing cast of characters and the Black Rose writing authors who created them on this episode, episode 36 of Launchpad. So on behalf of Mary Helen Sheriff, the author marketing coach, and myself, I want to welcome each of you. We are broadcasting live, so please feel free if you are watching us live, and we have folks who are doing just that, um, ask questions, make comments, join in on the conversation. Because on today's episode, we have murder, mayhem, ghosts, intrigue, secrets, altruism, and the power of a story that all comes together. Today, we'll talk about point of view, character development, Black Rose writing, and each of these authors' journeys to being right here with us on Launchpad. Welcome to each of you, um, Anoop Judge with her book, The Awakening of Mina Ruwat, Edward J. Leahy with Judgment of Beasts, Kim McCollum with What Happens in Montana, and in just a moment, Susan Sage, Dancing in the Ring. So welcome to each of you. How are each of you today? Doing, Doing quite great. well, thank you. I'm so glad to have you here on uh, Launchpad. So excited to partner on this episode with Black Rose Writing. Uh, creates so many great books. Anoop, start us out. Tell us about The Awakening of Mina Rawat. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Grace, uh, for the opportunity and for the question. Uh, the Awakening of Mina Rawat is the story of an untouchable who <coughs> grows up in an orphanage in India. Um, I'm not sure how many of your viewers or you yourself might know this, but there is a caste system that comes down right from the Vedas, which are the holy books of the Hindus, and that caste system delineates um, the, the four castes that exist by virtue of only birth. So if you're born an untouchable, you're going to remain an untouchable. Sorry, you're out on your luck, even if you might become a doctor or a scientist, and there's going to be a part of society, unfortunately, even today and this is um and this is ironic because when i first thought of this novel and wanting to write about what i call the cancer of indian society which is untouchability i thought i would have to predate it i thought it would be historical fiction and i began thinking of oh should i set it right before independence or after independence and then as i began to research and i began to move away from the metropolitan cities of delhi and mumbai i began to realize that it exists in small towns it exists in villages of course and unfortunately due to the rising fundamentalism nationalism in india it's becoming stronger instead of going away, even though when India gained independence, it was outlawed by the constitution. So constitutionally, it's illegal. But there are so many doctors in hospitals who will tell you they don't get opportunities for promotion. So I wanted to um, bring that up, this, uh, this, this uh, area that I found interesting myself and I thought others would too but I didn't want it to be a heavy subject because it can be because of the cruelty and the prejudice faced by untouchables in India so I decided to make it a love story. Wonderful well we'll hear more about that as we go through today's episode because you have so many things uh, so many layers within your book that we can talk about. Edward J. Leahy Judgment of Beasts talk to us about that. Thank you, Grace. Uh, the title, first of all, like all of my titles, <clears throat> comes from a quote in Shakespeare. And the quote is from Julius Caesar. It's by Mark Antony. And he says, O judgment, thou have fled to, to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason. And that's sort of an underlying theme in the novel. This is the fourth novel in the Kim Brady series. The first was Past Grief. The second was Deceived by Ornament. The third was Proving a Villain. And now we have Judgment of Beasts. And in this one, uh, Kim 
is the book opens with the assassination of a political rival of the mayor's. And the mayor has been a supporter of, of Kim. In fact, he has had at times a romantic interest in her that she has not returned. Uh, but she's in, in Bermuda recovering, at, recovering emotionally after her third consecutive miscarriage. And she's out for a run and she comes back and she is met by uh, an aide of the mayor's who is summoning her back to New York uh, to investigate this murder. And the mayor promises her whatever support she needs, she's got, he will cooperate in any way. And the, and the problem is that um, as she digs into it, she finds that he himself, the mayor, has possible motives for wanting this woman assassinated. And also his benefactors have means for wanting her assassinated. At the same time, there is a community activist who is playing up uh, the murder, the, the murder that is, is connected to, uh, seems to be connected to a proposed housing project or conversion of a housing project. And that begins to oh, shine the light on still others. And she needs to dig all through this. And this is, this is what she has to uh, come back <laughs> And we're being joined by someone's puppy during this uh, episode as well. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Grace. That's mine. And uh, he's locked in here with me and doesn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, uh, he's welcome at the episode. I don't know if he wants okay. to be outside or if he, he, he'd rather be in another room. But that, that's amazing. And you talk a lot about, um, you know, there's a lot of intrigue here and murder investigations. And then we move to Kim McCullough's where there's a murder that's uninvestigated. So Kim, tell us about your book, What Happens in Montana. Yeah, mine is a murder mystery, but I like to think of it more along the lines of like Big Little Lies, where somebody dies at the beginning, but it's not a big investigative detective type story. It's more about the relationship of these women who come to a haunted holistic hot springs retreat that actually exists and I stayed in it and it was pretty creepy. <laughs> um, and it's, so there's a reunion of these girlfriends who met when their babies were babies and now they're headed off to college. They've been friends for over 20 years and they're coming for this reunion. And there's an almost 80 year old chef who has been at this retreat for 30 years. And she prefers, I think of her kind of like a, um, Betty White type character. I mean, she's full of vim and vigor and she's, she tells it like it is, but she'd much prefer the company of her dog and the ghost than regular annoying people. Um, and then the ghost senses, you know, this connection. Well, Maude is helplessly drawn into these women because one of them reminds her of her daughter who died when she was only 20. Um, and so Maude is already drawn in and the ghost senses like, hey, maybe this is my chance here to move on, to, to you know, deal with what I need to deal with here and move on. So she gained strength by telling her story. And her story to me was fascinating doing the research that 18% of Montana's original homesteaders were single women. Can you imagine, you know, late 1800s coming by train, often with young children, leaving terrible situations, you know, alcoholic husbands and things like that. It was considered, you didn't have to go through a formal divorce. If your husband was an alcoholic, you could just leave him and it was, it was called good. So they would come out and get 320 acres of land if they farmed it for five years. And so these women did this and they were often teachers. The other really interesting thing that women did back then, they were moonshiners. A lot of the moonshiners back then were women because Number one, the police didn't prosecute them as harshly as they did men, and they could do it in their kitchens. You know, they could be baking, making breakfast and brewing a little hooch on the side. So <laughs> so they could leave their alcoholic husbands and create moonshine. <laughs> create moonshine so somebody else's husband could be a problem. <laughs> so, uh, so your book, Dancing in the Ring, where do you get the title from? Uh, mine is what happens in Montana. I, I'm sorry, what happened in Montana? I looked down at the wrong side. How did you, you so your, your title of what happens in Montana, does it stay in Montana? Well, that's the whole point. So the women meet, and it, this is a true story for me. I met, I lived in Las Vegas briefly, and I met this group of women at a mommy and me play group. And we've since a lot of us moved away. Um, but I thought it was interesting, you know, two of them come to Montana from Vegas 
and there's this showman type uh, hiking guide after they get chased by a moose. And he says, well, you need to go home and tell everyone about getting chased by a moose. Nobody can tell that story. And uh, he says, where are you from? And they say Vegas. And he goes, well, what happens in Montana doesn't have to stay in Montana. <laughs> oh, I, I love it. And again, apologies on the title. I'm hoping that Susan Sage still gets to join us. She was having some technical difficulties at the top of the show. Her book is Dancing in the Ring. She writes fiction and poetry. She's written three different novels. And uh, her story takes place in 1926. And hopefully she'll be able to join on and tell us a little bit more about it. It's got all sorts of things in it, like lawyers and murder and death and uh, people looking to save the world in some ways. So Anoop, let's go back to you. You're talking about um, your, your story with the class. And I actually did know a little bit about that, but I didn't know that it came from on high, if you will. Yes. Oh, oh okay. Good. No, it's great. Susan's going to take a second to join us and then we'll have her tell us about her book. So um, Susan, welcome. We'll get back to you in just one second. We're so glad you were able to join us. So Anoop, um, I didn't realize that the cast system was Hopefully it'll, it'll... D dictated. So tell us about that. Yes, it's derived, as I said, from the Hindu Vedas, which is the cornerstone of the Hindu religion. And so in that, it is described that a Brahman is made from the head of God, mm -hmm. meaning, and so if you're born a Brahman, you are do all the, uh, the prayer activities, the scholarly activities, you are supposed to be scholarly, and you naturally gravitate towards like being a priest in a temple. Uh, of course, modern day, many, many, many uh, everyday people belong to the Brahmin caste and they are not priests. They are lawyers, doctors, librarians, cash reg uh, cashiers, but they are still in uh, regarded and with a great deal of uh, reverence and given a lot of deference by and deferred to by a part of the Indian society because they're, they're the highest caste. Oh. And then you have the Khatriya, which is the warrior, which is, you know, they used to be able to help the kings in in uh, in, in war times. And then you have the tradesmen, which is the Shutra. And then you have the untouchables, which are derived from the feet of God. So within your book, you have a traumatic death. Talk about that, because I think our listeners will be very interested in that aspect of your novel. The traumatic death of? There's a mother's traumatic death and there are class issues? Uh, yes. Uh, the mother's traumatic death is, um, well, there's a traumatic incident that happens to the mother, Mina's mother. And... Um, earlier and that is by upper caste men she's raped and me mina the child only has a faint memory of it but the mother actually dies by natural causes but in the beginning of the book there is no help rendered to her by those who have committed their lives to helping others, meaning she's in an ambulance being transported to a hospital and uh, the medic in the ambulance refuses to touch her because she is an untouchable and that's still today this is there that an untouchables who work in people's houses who are uh, peons and maid servants and servants the servant class many times in the feudal lords or landlords in the villages they will bow out of the room just like as if you know, you're the king or queen of England, and they will stay out of view. And certainly, they will never contaminate your utensils with their mills. If that ever happens, they would be beaten. They would be, I mean, God knows what kinds of atrocities would be so, committed. So a real insight we'll get into these various aspects of um, Indian culture. Ed, in your book, you uh, talk about intrigue and information leaks and um, I was intrigued that a little bit of that has to do maybe with your own background with the IRS. So, <laughs> well, actually, uh, my I was I'm a retired tax accountant, and uh, I spent most of my career in the insurance industry, 
But the last segment of my career, I decided to get off the corporate hamster wheel and uh, I went and worked work for the dark side. I worked for the IRS. I was an international issue specialist. And uh, what's, what's a lot of fun to do, I find, is to incorporate different instances of your own experience uh, into the story that you're telling. And so uh, what I did here with the scheme that one of the investors, one of the backers of the mayor uh, is involved in has to do with something that I actually was in the process of auditing in my last year at the IRS, which is a scheme that takes money out of foreign subsidiaries, brings them back to the parent without making them, with making it look like it's not taxable income. And uh, this, I think, is still a problem, even though I retired several years ago. Uh, it's probably still a problem. But um, it would give someone a powerful motive to uh, deflect, to put false information out there. And that's one of the things that happens uh, to both the mayor and to Kim as she's investigating this. Uh, one, one of the leaks that gets out there is that uh, Kim and the mayor had at some point in the past had an affair, which was not true. Uh, but it was true that the mayor would have liked to have had an affair with her. Uh, and that's, that's actually a component of the, of the plot of, uh, of uh, proving a villain. But in, in judgment, she's, you know, he has promised I will cooperate to the fullest event, to its fullest extent. And then it gets leaked that he is also involved in this potential scheme of recycling foreign income. So, uh, it all makes her investigation that much more difficult, and it's something that she has to constantly fight to overcome. And from your character, Kim, to Kim McCollum, um, I don't want anybody to get confused about your character having an affair with the mayor and our Kim, who's with us here on screen. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm fascinated, Kim, how did you pick 1912 specifically in your era? Uh, Actually, I, it's not easy. Yeah, no, that, I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, as you know, when you're writing, your your timelines can get a little, you know, fuzzy, I guess you want to say. Um, and that I landed on 1912 specifically because they end up going through the drought, which was started 1917, 1918. And I needed the young character, the young girl to be a certain age when the drought came along because prior to the drought out in montana in fact one of the most famous women i researched um oh how can i forget her name i say her name all the time well it's not coming to me at the moment doesn't matter she came west and she was an editor and then she used her writing skill with um, the northern railway bulletin and she told these tales of strawberries as big as your fist and you know not having to irrigate because for a long time you didn't have to but then the drought came along in 1917 and a lot of people, you know, either had to pack up and leave or, you know, they had really, really difficult times. So my characters go through that and I needed to get to 1912 to get to the right age. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, and I think it's interesting, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wishing that Susan Sage could have stayed with us. It looked like she was able to log on for just a moment, but she picked 1926 and then she carries us up another 30 years. So we play with that uh, timeline indeed. I'd like to go back uh, for a minute uh, and going to Anoop. Tell us about how you picked your characters. Or did they pick you? No, unfortunately. I know a lot of authors say that. That doesn't happen to me. I, I'm teaching right now and this is what I tell my students too. I'm more of a theme and a plot driven novelist and of course characters have to be very compelling but the theme comes to me before and as I said I wanted to write about untouchability now for 13 years before I started my writing career I was um, an attorney and I was legal counsel for a 501c3 Organize, char charitable organization based here in the US, uh, which supports more than five, I mean, 6,000 um, orphan, disadvantaged, or otherwise destitute children in India. And it also supports one uh, project here in the US, uh, which, um, which serve the needs of hearing impaired children. So anyway, because of that, I had a close hand look at orphanages in India. 
And so since I had a very good idea of that, I wanted, I, I decided that I would make my untouchable character, Meena, and Ravat is the last name that gives away her cast to those who are in the know. So, you know, Indians who might be familiar. I myself wasn't, and I had to ask somebody, oh, well, Ravat is who she marries, an upper caste, but she really doesn't have me. She's Meena Kumari, first in the orphanage, which is the name that the orphanage gives to anybody who's an orphan. Anyway, so it's the awakening of Meena Ravat because she marries an upper caste man who falls in love with her, but then decides at some point in their marriage that his loathing of her caste um, has has uh, <laughs> unfortunately uh, come back and entered into their marriage and their relationship. Uh, and a lot of it is driven by his his mother who plants this, who puts the seed in his mind at the time he announces to her that he's going to marry this low, of, lowest of the low caste um, a girl and then continues to haunt him with questions of, doesn't she smell? I mean, things, just things like that. But yes, so Mina was the, uh, this was the character I began with. And then it, because it was going to be a love story, I had to put another untouchable boy in the same orphanage and that's Ram. And Ram decides, it goes to America, becomes a multimillionaire. And then they meet up later in life when Meena is married and Ram is divorced. And Meena has one daughter who adores. And so the question becomes, uh, not only does Ram remind her of her background, but of, of a passion that they shared, but also of a shared background where they both were persecuted against and were joined. They were both, uh, you know, best friends, teammates in a world that considered them, you know, the second citizens in their own country. And Ed, in your and book, so the question comes: Is she going to leave? I'm going to come back with you in just a second. And in Ed, in your book, you have characters yeah. that are linked over time. You actually write series, and you and I had a little bit of time to talk about that before we came on air. How do you get your characters, please? Well, I'll start with my main character uh, in the series we're talking about now, Kim Brady. Uh, when I first set out to write uh, a, a murder mystery, a thriller. Uh, I wanted, uh, I knew I wanted a female detective because I wanted someone who would not be able to employ the kinds of uh, strong on tactics that we also, we often see uh, presented in uh, TV shows and, you know, crime series and things like that. Uh, and I needed to match her with a situation where her talents would, would be needed in order to solve the crime. And so I decided that it also had to be someone with a, with a history. So first, the crime. Uh, the crime is a mass shooting uh, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, she has just returned from uh, burying her father who committed suicide because unlike her grandfather, her father was not a hero detective. He was really in the gray areas. So it turns out that there is only one eyewitness to this shooting uh, who actually saw the shooter, and that is a transgender woman who has not come out and is terrified of being outed. So Kim first has, first has to figure out that that's what happened. Secondly, has to track her down. And thirdly, has to convince her to come forward, which she really doesn't want to do. And in the meantime, she's being uh, gaslighted by someone from within the department who's also obstructing her investigation. So that's the first challenge that Kim needed to overcome. And there is a small cast of characters I built around her. And some of those have carried forward into the, the novels that follow. Um, one of the characters in that, first, in that first novel is a detective who had at one time partnered with her father and who may have the details on why her father committed suicide and how he managed to do it. Uh, and he becomes reunited with her when she's, in, when she's been transferred to Brooklyn and she's assigned to this case. And he ends up as, as her new partner. This is great. And I'm so happy that some of our 
um, Bookish Road Trip Facebook people are making comments. Someone just saw a production of Julius Caesar a few days ago, so this is very apt, Ed, that you would be talking about this. All of your books sound amazing, and Lee Bukowski, who is one of our administrators here and does a wonderful job on our road show, say all of these books sound fascinating. We still have time on our show, and I'm going to continue our discussion, but if you are watching, please feel free to make comments, ask questions. Um, I know that our authors would love to hear from you. Kim, I want to come to you about the characters. You talked about your 80-year-old character, and I am particularly drawn, as I age myself, to older characters. So how did you decide that you wanted this character? I absolutely love quirky characters and strong women. That is definitely going to be the theme. My next book has these kinds of characters as well. I love um, a man called, is it o Uva? I've heard it uh -huh. pronounced a bunch of ways. Or like Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Those types of almost initially unlikable characters that you end up loving. And Maud is a little bit this way, that that's the name of the almost 80 year old. And so the most of the most of the book is set in present day. And then the, the ghost just weaves her tale in. So that's how I drew in. I love a book where you're having fun and you're actually learning a little something at the same time. So um, yeah, so Maud was just, she just was a, one of my quirky, fun characters. And I thought of my grandma and Betty White whenever I wanted her to say something. <laughs> and um, you were talking about how one of the characters gains strength through storytelling. That's the ghost. Yeah, the ghost um, relives her tale. And the, so at this haunted holistic hot springs in Montana, you know, where I went and stayed, there is it. I kept the same name. Her name is Simone. That's the ghost. Um, and all that's known about her is that she was a prostitute in Butte who was killed. And so I thought, you know, why don't I bring in this cool information I got about female homesteaders and moonshining and create her backstory. And so she gains her strength. Like the, the characters in the book can't hear her. I didn't want it to be like hokey and weird. You know, they can't hear her talking. She's, she's talking just to the reader. And as she's doing so, she's gaining strength. You know, she, she mentions things like, oh, I actually, ha I didn't know it took you know, your, your haunting muscles atrophy when you don't use them. <laughs> so she's practicing doing some haunting and some, she does a chill here or there, you know, it's nothing over the top, but she's trying to be involved with this cast of characters that she's really drawn to. And she senses that they are her means of moving on. She doesn't want to stay in the in-between forever. Wonderful. And uh, Michelle Ann Waite, one of our viewers says she loves quirky and strong and love good ghosts, and at least the good ghosts. And Susan Sage, as I mentioned, who's unable to uh, join us, but is also a Black Rose writing author and wrote Dancing in the Ring. Um, when Anoop mentioned that she was an attorney, she has multiple attorneys in uh, her book, Dancing in the Ring, as well. So hopefully you will check out uh, her book as well. Anoop, talk about your experience of becoming a published author. <clears throat> it's been wonderful. <laughs> and, and okay, <laughs> there's one thing. I mean, I came to this country, I passed the bar exam. I first passed the baby bar exam. I had an eight month old baby when I passed the California state bar. I practiced for seven years um, in a law firm and then um, the health circumstances of my daughter forced me to stay at home. She's on autopilot with the health now. And so that's when I decided to go back to my first passion, my first love, which is writing, because the Lord absolutely didn't interest me anymore. But it has been an eye opener as to how difficult it is to be a published author. I mean, I thought the law was hard. I mean, <laughs> the California, the California bar exam notably was known. Um, New York and uh, California had were the only ones that were the hardest in the country at that time. I mean, I was born in the <laughs> age of the chariot and the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the race and the chariot. So the horse and the chariot, I'm sorry. So, you know, this was uh, about 20, 29 years ago my, uh, when I passed the bar exam. And it was New York and California at that time were the most challenging. But being a published author, oh my God, if I didn't have this streak of persistence in me, I actually don't even know what made me continue dig in my heels and decide, I, I, no, I'm good. 
I agree. It is an amazing experience. Ed, has, how has becoming an author changed your life very quickly? Uh, well, it, it took a long time to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, started out trying to get uh, Past Grief published. Actually, I had a false start before that, but I tried, started trying to get Past Grief published uh, in 2018 and uh, went, did the round of uh, querying and uh, submitted uh, a lot of different uh, uh, full manuscripts to different agents. And uh, when I kept getting lack of interest back, I realized something wasn't right. And uh, I also, I belong to Mystery Writers of America and uh, they have a uh, mentor program. So I signed up for that and I was assigned a terrific mentor and uh, he actually was so good in the brief time that we had together that I asked him if he would, you know, sign on to be a book doctor, book doctor for past grief. And he agreed. And, uh, together we, we hammered it into shape and I learned probably more about writing in the six months that I worked with him than I have at any other time. And it, it really, it really got me off to, to a, a running start, but, uh, Finally, I was on, uh, I participated in a uh, pitch, an online pitch fest uh, run by SavvyAuthors.com. And I was, uh, ended up getting interest from uh, one agent and one publisher. And the publisher came, the publisher was Reagan Roth of Black Rose Writing. And he said, immediately came back and said, send me the whole manuscript. And I did, and I still hadn't heard from the agent when I heard back from him again and said, and he said, we're offering you a contract. So, Fabulous. so I still don't have an agent. Well, that's <laughs> but a I, great, I, great story and great advice. Last but not least, Kim, tell us quickly how writing has I changed you. I have a similar story with a couple of years of querying. I had started out getting my MFA at Harvard and got about halfway through and loved it, but I realized they don't help you get published at all. <laughs> and unless you want to teach, your MFA doesn't do much. I mean, it definitely helps with writing and all that, but not with getting published. So two years, lots of rejections, lots of full requests, but then they went nowhere. And I ended up with Black Rose and I've been extremely happy. What I, what I love most about Black Rose are the other, right? well, team is amazing. Don't I, But what I love is the, the writers. They're not competitive with each other. They really support each other and we try to lift each other up. It's incredible. It, it's absolutely wonderful. I have enjoyed having each of you on the show. I hope that our listeners will also check out Susan Sage's book, Dancing in the Ring. In the meantime, a new judge, the Awakening of Mina Watt. Thank you for being with us. Edward J. Leahy, Judgment of Beasts. Check out Julius Caesar at the same time. And Kim McCollum, What Happens in Montana. Thanks so much on behalf of Mary Helen Sheriff, the author, marketing coach, and myself. Thanks for being with us here on Launchpad. This episode is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for visiting with us on Launchpad.